next uh, scientific presentation uh, is from uh, Dr. Philip Janko uh, from the MD Anderson Cancer Institute and Dr. Janko will present his research data on IDILA uh, prototype as for a cell-free uh, RNA. Uh, Dr. Janko is an assistant professor uh, of the Department of Investigational Cancer Therapeutics at MD Anderson. Um, is involved in a many phase one uh, clinical protocols uh, published more than 100 papers uh, in the field. Okay. So thank you so much for a nice introduction and thanks very much for having me. And as actually a link I just alluded to, I mean, what is different uh, about me compared to the previous speakers that I'm actually not a pathologist, I'm a simple-minded oncologist and I do medicines very simple-minded way. And sometimes actually, I mean, obviously if you know very little, it's, it's never an advantage, but sometimes when you don't know that much, you don't have the whole baggage of thinking why things cannot work. And sometimes it can actually work towards your advantage. And uh, so uh, I will be talking mainly focusing on liquid biopsies, which is essentially applicating uh, application of that technology on the liquid materials, which will be mainly actually plasma, although we have some data on this urine as well. But I will have a little bit of data on tissue as well. So one of the things, one of the reasons why we actually need uh, liquid biopsies or why we need some other source of material, other tissue, is actually demonstrated on this slide. This is one of uh, the first global endeavors to match patients with uh, molecular targeted agents based on the molecular profile, based on the underlying mutation. And in that study, which was published by one of my colleagues, Lia Sinderu, we actually found that there is about 10% of patients who do not have enough tissue to allow molecular analysis to be carried out. And 10% of patients is a relatively substantial number, and I assume that outside of the large cancer center, this number might be actually even higher than that. Another thing which we need to keep in mind, and which I'm trying to demonstrate on this slide, is that the molecular profile that you get from the tissue is really kind of dependent on the way you stick a needle in the patient if you do the biopsy. This is a, uh, this is a primary sample of breast cancer, the, pri uh, the primary uh, breast cancer sample. And you can actually see if you stick a needle in the North Pole, you get PIX3CA mutation at the on 20. If you stick it in the middle, you get wild out PIX3CA. And if you stick it in the South Pole of the sample, you get actually mutation in exon 9 of PIX3CA. And obviously, these situations might have different clinical implications. In addition to that, the molecular profile can actually change over time. It's not really a static thing, and it's a thing which is very dynamic, which is dependent on what the cancer does, and also what we do to the cancer during the course of treatment. So this is the case of non-small cell lung cancer, this EGFR mutation, which initially was treated, uh, this EGFR mutation, exon 21, as you can see, and B53 mutation, which was initially treated as chemotherapy and subsequently EGFR inhibitor or lotony, but at the time when the patient progressed, the biopsy showed that uh, there was an uh, emergence of P790M mutation in exon 20 of uh, EGFR, which was associated with resistance. So the patient actually went on the third or fourth, and fourth line of chemotherapy, but by the time the biopsy was repeated, the resistance mutation already went away and the patient responded again to a lot of it. And this is kind of nicely demonstrates the case that we only need to have a tool which allows you to monitor a molecular profile in real time. And obviously you can do repeated biopsy, but I mean it's not really something which would be scalable, in, uh, uh, scalable to be done on a regular basis. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but liquid biopsies are essentially looking at multiple material, including CTCs and other stuff, but I will focus on cell-free DNA, which, uh, which are actually small fragments of DNA, which are, uh, which are released to the circulation from dying cancer cells, but also from the stroma, and which can be detected and used for molecular diagnostics. So, applications for liquid biopsies, or for cell-free DNA testing, uh, if you will, is identification of molecular targets in patients in whom you don't have material for molecular studies. You can also use it for assessment of prognosis, for assessment of cancer recurrence slash progression, and for monitoring of response to cancer therapy, and monitoring of the molecular profile in real time, as I showed on the previous slide. So this is a nice example which documents how liquid biopsies can actually, can actually supplement or can replace the tissue diagnosis in some scenarios which are difficult in the clinic. 
Uh, lot, 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 has, lot has been said about melanoma, and melanoma is relatively easy to biopsy, but one, uh, uh, one of the disease of, uh, which is very hard to uh, uh, very, which is very hard to diagnose through molecular pathology is a uh, rare type of histiocytosis which is called Erhamschester disease. Erhamschester disease often involves bones and other organs and has a lot of stromal components. So if you do a biopsy, it's actually very hard to get it uh, to get a histiocytic DNA for molecular analysis. In addition, these patients are actually known to have BRAF mutation and they are actually known to respond to BRAF inhibitor. Even more so, I mean, if you, on the other hand, if you give BRAF inhibitor to patients who don't have BRAF mutation, you are actually risking that the cancer might progress even faster. So it's actually really important to know the molecular status. This is the study which we did in a few patients because it's a rare disorder in which we diagnosed BRAF mutation using uh, uh, other technologies than ideal. It was actually Dropa Digital PCR is one of our collaborators which combined, which combined the, uh, the BioRAP technology and Rainnet technology. Um, and we actually found that uh, in patients in, in whom we know BRAF mutation status, we were able to convert it to plasma DNA. In patients in whom we didn't know BRAF mutation, we were actually able to identify it and do additional samples in the urinary, in the urinary cell free DNA. We did something similar with the IDEA platform uh, in eight patients with Erhamschester disease. And again, uh, in, uh, we were actually able to detect, with one exception, uh, we were actually able to detect BRAF mutations in the plasma in patients with, uh, in whom we know that they had BRAF mutation. Uh, we were able to confirm it with alternative technology such as beaming in one case. Unfortunately, in some other cases, it wasn't done. And there was actually one, really only one failure in which we were not able to find the BRAF mutation by IDEA, but it was actually a patient who was actively treated on treatment at the time when we did the molecular analysis. And we know that treatment can actually suppress the level of BRAF mutant DNA which circulates in the system. This is just a brief uh, summary how uh, how actually mutation load can uh, influence patient survival. These are our data with BMEC, which actually shows that the patients with KRAS mutation, with any cancer type, with any advanced cancer, and this high level of KRAS mutation in the bloodstream versus uh, versus low level of BRAF mutation in the bloodstream, that they actually have a difference in overall survival, which is statistically significant. We also did a combined analysis in which we uh, in which we combined any mutation and we tested in this data set BRAF, EGFR, KRAS, and P3CA, and it looked like that irrespective of the mutation type high level of mutant DNA was actually associated with this worse overall survival. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because that has been discussed by my predecessors, but I will move to our tissue study which started back in 2011 when Biocart, this was a, like a really small company with a few people. And we embarked on a study which, in which we tested samples from advanced cancer patients referred to our department and in, in whom we know we have mutation status from the technology which was done as a part of the routine clinical workup in our CLIA lab, which was mostly PCR-based sequencing confirmed by Sanger, and later on, later on C-Phenol, and in a few samples we had ion torrent as the technology evolved. And out of 100 samples which we tested on IDELA, you have to understand that we didn't really do anything sophisticated. We didn't do laser micro dissection, we didn't even do actual micro macro dissection, and we just actually got a sample from the pathology. We knew, we knew that there was a tumor, but we didn't even know what was the cellularity. So we did actually really kind of a simple and brutal way. And as you can see, the observed agreement rate is actually strikingly similar to what you have, uh, what you observed is the data which were presented by two of my predecessors. And the agreement rate in our data set was 96%. So when I actually saw this data coming out, I was kind of thinking, okay, obviously it's not minimized that good, so it must be the technology. So that what actually moved us to move to the liquid biopsy field because we, uh, because we anticipated that actually the detection, detection rate must be much better than 1% as was tested in the LOD experiments for the, for the tissue. I mean, we tested our first plasma sample about a year and a half ago. I mean, initially we just put the plasma sample in the cartridge and it didn't work out, but then I isolated the DNA, put the DNA into that and it actually worked out fine. And we started doing that about a year and a half ago using samples which were collected from patients referred to our department at the time of disease progression. And it was about 160 patients in whom we know the BRAF mutation status from the clinical testing which was done as a part of the clinical care. And um, the agreement rate between plasma, 
which was not necessarily taken at the same time as the tissue, and which was not tested at the same time as tissue, it was about 88%. The sensitivity was about 73%, specificity 98%, positive predictive volume 96%, and negative predictive volume 85%, which is actually really in the, in the, in the ballpark which you anticipate for the liquid, for other liquid biopsy technologies. We also uh, to date confirmed 15 out of 19 discrepancies with uh, technology which has the most data to date, which is called Beaming. And we actually found 100% agreement with IDELA. So perhaps the discrepancies which we are seeing are actually not really due to technology, but due to some other factors such as, uh, due, such as human heterogeneity and actual development of the mutation profile in real time. This is one of the clinical cases, a patient with metastatic appendiceal carcinoma with BRAF V600 mutation in plasma and plethicum ideal. And you can actually follow the bars which reflect the tumor size. The blue line actually reflects the CA tumor marker and the red line reflects the level of cell-free DNA for BRAF. And you can actually see that the levels of cell-free DNA quickly normalized after the introduction of BRAF inhibitor which was later on confirmed on the, uh, on the imaging petals which showed partial response to therapy. The BRA mutation actually started to go up at the time when the cancer actually started to progress. This is a patient, 63 years old, with Erhard-Chester histiocytosis, treated with Vemorafen, and again, you can actually see that cell-free DNA in the, was very much in agreement with, uh, with, uh, imaging, uh, with, with imaging as uh, followed by resist criteria. One of, the, one of the applications which I think ideal would be ideal tool providing that we have more assay in place would be actually to, uh, to look at uh, the emergence of the resistance mutation which can perhaps modify our decisions in terms of therapy. And this is exactly what we are looking for. This is a slide which demonstrates uh, uh, Keras type based on tissue uh, testing uh, colorectal cancer. And as uh, was documented in two studies in 2012, uh, many of these patients actually demonstrate the emergence of Keras mutation in the cell free DNA, which was actually not detected previously in the tissue. And I mean, the question obviously, which is elephant in the room, can we actually do something clinically to modify what we do to the patient to act based on the cell free DNA levels? And this, uh, these, studies, uh, these studies are currently being designed and uh, will be hopefully underway soon. So liquid biopsies have a potential to further advise the personalized cancer medicine, and I hope I made, made a case for that. I think there are several applications, some of them are low-hanging fruit, such as determining the prognosis, uh, perhaps early recurrence and disease progression, but also one of the utility which I can see is monitoring of the molecular profile in the real time, and perhaps acting on that therapeutically. And I believe that IDELA, uh, because, of, uh, because of the ease of use and really the limited hands-on time, will have a role in that field. I just had actually this morning that IDELA is actually pretty much, uh, uh, pretty much a technical solution for uh, 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 for taking the plasma without previous DNA isolation, which obviously would uh, uh, further simplify the whole process. Thank you so much for your attention.